in this fifth episode of our journey through the book of Ruth, we are diving into uh, the opening section of this book. We'll be looking at uh, chapter one, verses uh, one to five together. And uh, we're going to just read it and then work our way through it um, and uh, and see what the Lord might have to say to us through this portion of scripture. Ruth chapter 1, verse 1. During the time of the judges, there was a famine in the land. A man left Bethlehem and Judah with his wife and two sons to stay in the territory of Moab for a while. This man's name was Elimelech, and his wife's name was Naomi. The names of his two sons were Malon and Chilion. They were Ephratites from Bethlehem in Judah. They entered the fields of Moab and settled there. Naomi's husband, Elimelech, died, and she was left with her two sons. Her sons took Moabite women as their wives. One was named Orpah, and the second was named Ruth. After they lived in Moab about 10 years, both Mylon and Chilion also died, and the woman was left without her two children and without her husband. And this really is a very um, amazing introduction to the book of Ruth. It sets the scene so well, and uh, we are introduced straight away to uh, the main characters of the story. And um, we get a real sense of the, uh, the the place where the story begins. Um, different stories start in different ways, and and uh, and some will start where everything seems to be going well, and then everything uh, seems to be falling apart, and then there's some great turnaround of events, and everything uh, seems to be going well again. Um, this story is a little bit different, where the scene is quite dim and dark and dire. And uh, we see that right in the opening verse that there was a famine in the land. And uh, we straight away see that, that there was a work of God that was judging the people of Israel. Now, we know, and we've said before, that during the time of the judges, this was a dark time in the history of Israel. Um, we know that in the closing verse of the book of Judges, it says this, in those days there was no king in Israel and everyone did what seemed right to him. And uh, those are easy enough words to read, but um, the kind of lawlessness and, um, and, and evil that was filled the land um, we get a glimpse of that as you read the book of Judges, and we see that this uh, incredible story was set in amongst that time, and 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 really, uh, what is set in this opening chapter is something of a dark backdrop on which uh, the 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 light of God is going to shine from. Um, I have heard a amazing. Uh, analogy used by several different people at different times and and that is that when you go to buy a diamond for an engagement ring they'll sit you down and they won't just hand the diamond to you to have a look at but they'll first put down a piece of black velvet and then place the diamond on that and the dark backdrop helps you to see the beauty of the diamond and to see its different facets and and in a real way this opening paragraph, we see something of the dark backdrop for the story. And now this, as I said, was a time of judges, and there was uh, um, uh, these judges were people who were raised up by God to, uh, to, to lead and to defend and to protect and to deliver the people of Israel. You see time and time again that uh, Israel as a people would uh, sin against the Lord, they would turn away from him, they would not follow his ways, they would not trust in him as their Lord, and they would worship other gods, and they would take on practices of the pagan nations around them, and they would uh, harden their hearts even towards God, and then God would bring about some sort of 
calamity and usually in the form of another nation coming to conquer them and 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 uh, and rule over them and then god would raise up a judge and that judge would be used by god to 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 lead the people and to deliver them from their great enemy and uh, one that just comes to mind is um is uh, uh samson and and samson with his great strength and great power was was used by god to uh, bring about victories for the people of God and to uh, and to to lead them um, into great victories. Another uh, a, a judge that we can think of is Deborah, who um, uh, alongside Barak led the people to a great victory and to uh, liberation from their captors. Uh, we can think of Gideon, who um, uh, at a uh, a terrible time in Israel. He, the, the, we're introduced to him as he's uh, uh, threshing wheat inside a wine press, which doesn't work very well. But they, as soon as they would harvest food, it would be it would be taken by their captors, and and so he was hiding in this wine press, actually uh, trying to thresh uh, the the wheat so that he could eat. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him and called him, and and he led the people of Israel to a great victory. And so this time of judges was uh, a, a, a time where the people would again and again um, sin against the Lord and God by his grace would rescue them. But the, the Lord didn't only bring about judgment through the nations around them. We see here that during the time of judges, there was a famine in the land. Now, this wasn't just a, a, a natural disaster this wasn't just a, a, a random event, but we need to, to recognize uh, that the, the, the Lord brings about judgment on the earth uh, through various means, but that it is always out of a kindness and a goodness not to leave the people where they are. The truth is the whole world is under judgment since the fall. There is a judgment of God that has been placed on the earth. Uh, Romans 8 talks about this bondage to decay, this um, this, this uh, um, bondage to futility, and that all of creation sits under this inside this, this bondage. And, and this is something of a judgment from the Lord, but it's a kindness of the Lord as well. It's a, it's, it's a judgment uh, intending to point people back towards God. And, and so even the judgments that he brought on Israel was not uh, a, a merely a sense of punishment, but out of a kindness to 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 cause them to wake up and to see the error of their ways and to find true life in him. We need to understand that as a result of the fall, uh, the, there is there is uh, much darkness and difficulty. And often we want to attribute even natural disasters to Satan. And, and, and while Satan has a lot to do with the things that go wrong in the world, he's never outside of the authority of God. Isaiah 45 verse 7, uh, God speaking says this, I form light and create darkness. I make success and create disaster. I am the Lord who does all these things. Amazing statements. We remember the book of Job and, and uh, as Job faced various calamities and disasters and difficulties and hardships, his wife said to him, why do you still hold on to your faith? Just curse God and die. And he responds to him, Job 2 verse 10, you speak as a foolish woman speaks, he told her. Should we accept only good from God and not adversity? Throughout all this, Job did not sin in what he said. So he recognized that the adversity that he faced ultimately was done by the Lord's hands. And he didn't curse God from it uh, through that. And in the same way, this adversity that was facing the nation of Israel was from the Lord's hand. But it was the intention of it was to draw his people back to himself. And how does uh, Elimelech respond in this time? It says in verse 1 that this man, Elimelech, left Bethlehem with his wife and two sons to stay in the territory of Moab for a while. 
and Bethlehem was a place, uh, it, it meant a place of bread or house of bread. And it's quite ironic that uh, these people were were hungry, um, even perhaps close to starving. And so they left the house of bread to another land to go and find the food there and to go and find safety and security there. And this really is something of a, a natural inclination of people to make their own plan and to even flee from God, coming out from under the wing of his protection to uh, find rest in another land. We'll read later in chapter two, uh, Boaz blessing Ruth and saying, may you receive full reward from the God of Israel under whose wings you have come for refuge. Uh, Psalm 51 verse one says, be gracious to me, God, be gracious to me, for I take refuge in you. I will seek refuge in the shadow of your wings until danger passes. And Elimelech was wrong in this moment to go and find help in another place, in another land. Instead, what God was trying to do was draw them, the nation closer to himself. And instead, what he should have done is respond to God and repent for his own sin and, and, and lean into God and trust God and stay amongst God's people and uh, pursue that refuge in the shadow of the wings of God. And I think so often, even in our lives today, when we face difficulty and hardship, our inclination is to turn to other means to find a resolution, to make a plan. Uh, I, I was chatting to a friend yesterday, and we we're talking about the statement, a self-made man. So often, even as men, we, we feel the need to, uh, to make a plan and to make things happen and to do it on our own. But that's a foolish thought and that's a foolish response. Instead, we should be those who uh, cling to God, who cry out and be gracious to me, Lord, to find refuge in him and in the shadow of his wings until da danger passes. So they, it says they went to stay in the territory of Moab for a while. And, and so they said, no, let's just go and we'll find a bit of relief there. We'll maybe do some trading there, do a bit of work and then come back. But we know that, that sin never just lets us have a little bit. It always wants to take more and more and more and more. It says that uh, they entered the fields of Moab and settled there. And this really is uh, something like what we see in Psalms chapter 1. It says, how happy is the one who does not walk in the advice of the wicked or stand in the pathway with sinners or sit in the company of mockers. Instead, his delight is in the Lord's instruction and he meditates on it day and night. He is like a tree planted beside flowing streams that bears its fruit in season and its leaf does not wither. Whatever he does prospers. And here we see the, the way of the wicked. This person walks in the advice the wicked and then he stands in the pathway with sinners and then he sits in the company of mockers and often we think well let's just dip our toe into the sin let's just see what happens when we try this or that but often when we dip our toe then we want to put our feet in and then we want to put our legs in and then we say well let's just have a little swim we'll swim back and before we know it we'll wash down the river and as happened with um, with Elimelech, he entered the fields of Moab and settled there. And it was not a blessing. It was not a place of fruitfulness. It was not a place of life and life in abundance that God had. It was not a place where they found refuge and shelter and protection because there they faced other hardships and some sort of sickness came upon Elimelech. Um, we don't know exactly what happened, but he died. And then Naomi was left with two sons. And what did they do? So more than just going and staying amongst the Moabites, more than just then settling there, then they took wives for themselves, wives from the people of Moab. And this was a, 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 a clear violation of God's instruction. Deuteronomy 7, 2 verse 4, it says, Make no treaty with them, with the surrounding nations. And show them no mercy. You must not intermarry with them. And you must not give your daughters to their sons or take their daughters for your sons. 
because they will turn your sons away from me to worship other gods. Then the Lord's anger will burn against you and he will swiftly destroy you. We know King Solomon sinned in this way. It says King Solomon loved many foreign women in addition to Pharaoh's daughter, Moabite, Womanite, Edomite, Sidon, Sidian, and Hittite women from the nations about which the Lord had told the Israelites, you must not intermarry with them and they must not intermarry with you because they will turn your hearts to fo uh, away to follow their gods. To these women, Solomon was deeply attracted in love. He had 700 wives who were princesses and 300 who were concubines. And listen to this, and they turned his heart away. So these young men, Mahalon and Chilion, uh, disobeyed God and intermarried with these women. But what we will see here is that God in his grace, he worked a powerful redemptive plan and he worked good even through the sinful actions of um, this man and his sons. He is kind and good and powerful to work in our lives and even to work uh, around and through the sinful actions of others for his glory and for our good. And we see this most perfectly and beautifully expressed in the cross of Christ as he uh, uh, worked through the sinful actions of, of, uh, of many to bless us and to glorify his great name forever and ever. And, and we really see the, the pinnacle of the glory of God is this grace poured out in Christ. And so when we see this story, do we think, well, then we should sin that God's glorious grace may be ever more revealed. Romans 6 verse 1 to 2 says, what then should we say? Should we continue in sin that grace may multiply? Absolutely not. And so we see in the story God's grace even in introducing Ruth uh, to Naomi and and drawing them together for for better or for worse and and bringing Ruth into the story of God's redemptive plan for the people of God, but we don't read this and foolishly think, well, then we should sin and we should disobey God's revealed will so that uh, we might see His His hidden will outworked his hidden will filled with grace and power and goodness and life revealed no 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 that's a foolish way to respond because it didn't work out well for Elimelech did it it didn't work out well for Mylon and Chilion did it no it was a hardship and difficulty and despair for them so instead we should follow God wholeheartedly and at the same time recognize when we get it wrong God's grace is there to meet us when we make mistakes, God's grace is there to help us and to hold us. And we should not be like those people who flee from God, but those people who press into God, who come under the shadow of his wings and find refuge in him. God bless you, and we'll see you next time as we continue looking at this remarkable book of Ruth together.